Hey everybody, welcome back to The Voice in the Hollow. My name is Miguel. Trent. And we have a special guest today, uh, Chris Bosjanic, face shape extraordinaire. How are you, sir? I'm good, how are you guys doing? Thanks for having me. Good, so uh, we're gonna jump into some awesome stuff that Chris is gonna show us, uh, but I guess we just wanted to start off by showcasing, you can see we have a brand new logo. Uh, made by our good friend Isaac, uh, who's, uh, let me see if we have this over here. You guys could look at some of his work online. Uh, we've used them for uh, the Nino when we did uh, the logo for that. And whenever we needed really cool images, uh, he was our go to guy. Um, he's an amazing artist. And you could see if you zoom into this thing, level of detail that this guy puts into everything is insane and it's all just like dot by dot by dot it's really a beautiful thing to behold the, the artwork this guy does is incredible he is uh not only do we use him for um for our artwork you can see like all the little dots you could actually feel them there how kick-ass that is this is not like a jitter brush or nothing it's literally uh, point by point and uh he yeah we have our we have some of his artwork hanging in our walls framed up he's he's amazing and that's actually how we met him originally was i bought a poster of his uh print from pan's labyrinth that i love i'm looking at it actually right now and uh i reached out to him to do some of the artwork for the Nino, and he said yes so um yeah he's amazing his girlfriend is amazing artist as well uh, so check them out on that uh, Instagram link if you're if you want to follow some of his artwork. Uh, cannot recommend him enough. So yeah, pretty happy with this. Uh, shows how there this is not a kid friendly uh, animated film, and uh, there will be blood in this. So yeah, we wanted to capture all of that in there. So very happy with that. So yeah. So let me take this off. So. Our guest today, like I said, is Chris. You can follow him 
at a uh, ginger stud 69 <laughs> 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 the greatest uh name of all time uh and chris is someone that we've known for many years at this point already he helped us he's like the fifth beetle in our band um he helped us huge on the Ningyo. he we wouldn't have gotten it done without him uh he's just brings so much to everything we do and um yeah Tran, do you want to add anything to that i think yeah. that mic was off yeah no chris is incredible so everything he does is better than what i would do yeah for sure that so. is so not true come on it is actually yes it is it's yeah, not true. We grow up, we want to be like Chris. But yeah, yeah. so he helped us a lot on, on the Nino. He did, a, it, it, he did a lot of stuff, but the things that he really blew our minds on was the face stuff that he did. And we reached out to him while we were doing this, and we're like, Chris, would you uh, consider doing this? And you know, to our surprise, he still said yes to us. Uh, most people just completely block us on Facebook after they've worked with us for a little bit because they don't want to work on uh, on this shit anymore. But uh, Chris, uh, do you want to show some of your stuff? Uh, uh, he's going to play his reel. Sure. I um, yes. Yeah, I mean, let me. It's this reel that I got is pretty old, um, but I don't know. It's the True. only thing I got. So um, I'll kind of show you kind of. I've spent, you know, most of my career. Um, I've kind of done, been lucky enough to do kind of everything um, in terms of like, I'm basically a production modeler, but, um, you know, I started out in TV doing like stylized TV show um, called The Clone Wars. And I, you know, I spent <coughs> probably like seven years doing that and then went into games, um, did that for a couple of years at Telltale and um, then went back into VFX and um, I was... You know, for a long time, I was at DD as a uh, senior and lead facial modeler for um, a lot of their films. Um, and now I'm currently um, a cinematic artist at Blizzard. Um, so that's kind of a little background on me. Um, so here's an old reel. It's not you, super you updated. But if you want. Yeah. You, I, did I have my phone number? I don't even know if that's the right phone number. You can try it. I'll pick up. Um. <clears throat> so usually if you could get the guy that worked on Thanos to work on your stuff it's a good idea well I agree Great idea. hopefully 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 I don't butcher it too much um, so tell us what you did on these uh, uh, so for uh, Infinity it says it below, War yeah. Yeah. Um, I built Thanos' head um and uh you know did some of the shape work a lot of the the puppet management um as well and then um i built i modeled the infinity gauntlet um some of thanos's armor his battle armor um and some of his clothing um <clears throat> and then basically i was basically on ebony maw and red skull and the Hulk um, as well um, for their facial puppets and prepping their models um, and getting them ready for um, you know the rest of the departments. Um, so a lot of work. I, I was lucky enough to kind of touch a little bit of everything um, on that show. Um, and you know, on the Nino, I did a lot of shape work for 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 you guys. Um, and, and some creature stuff. stuff, yeah. You know, yeah, and I, a lot of stuff. the one thing that I, I think I, I would say that was great about the Nino is it, it came at a time in my career where I had just finished working at Lucasfilm on Clone Wars, and you know, all my work was very stylized, right? And I think a lot of employers were like, it's really stylized, uh, we don't know, <laughs> they can't really see the jump into something that's more realistic um and when i was able when i saw that you guys were like hey is it we could use help if, if someone wants to help out and you know luckily you guys let me 
Um, and I, I think the big reward for that for me was, even though I wasn't getting paid, was the the realism work that I needed for my reel to kind of get past that 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 roadblock of you only have stylized work. Um, Which is really silly. I've, I've always thought that was so goofy. Like a lot of uh, HR can't see past. And that, I think that has to do with the fact that HR department is not necessarily the artist. And I think any good artist would be able to see a good sculptor doing any style and be like, oh, this person understands uh, form and anatomy. You could just throw him on anything and he's going to know how to do yeah. it. Yeah. Um, you also made the, the ship too, the Sharon. The Nino? The, the, yeah, so oh, the summary. Oh, mm. You're also very good at hard surface modeling, yeah, was, too. That was a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, so it's like I always think of, you know, those things. You know, it's like you guys had, like, a really great opportunity. And, uh, you know, I think I don't, I don't know how students reacted to helping you guys. But, you know, I think that was, like, a very big opportunity for anybody that was trying to get their foot in the door or, or get some, like, really good quality work on their reel um you know your guys's work is better than than most you know full vfx studios work um which is pretty pretty mind-blowing um when you look at like the sheer volume of you know talent that you guys have and you know actual just amazing artistic skills to kind of put this all together and you know i've been following you guys kind of like throughout all of your different processes and it's like you've grown so much since the first stuff that i saw you guys doing and now it's you know you guys are just doing stuff that no one else can really do with just two people um it's oh, it's, it's pretty three amazing people now we well <laughs> Which it was two you? but it's now we, we adopted you <laughs> you're our <Yeah>. son <laughs> well i i definitely think that none of the the nino stuff would have turned out that's good because yeah. you're talking about performances at this point. So sure, we can get like a a nice still somewhere and it would look nice. But then how is that going to perform? Obviously, we had great animator um, yeah. on this too, um, Alon. But, yeah. you know, you have to make something for the animator to work with. And all, you know, it's made a huge difference for us. Yeah, the only thing that made me sad about that is on the Ninja, we built these beautiful models of creatures. And you just see them on like one shot. And it's like, oh my like, God, because all in all, we probably spent a month or two months per character. Yeah. And they were in a fucking one shot. I mean, that's well, we two months. We didn't have the rendering power. And and that's where No, but I mean a month, two months for just to develop the model, the textures, yeah. the look development, the face stuff. It was it was a while and we used it for one shot. Yeah. Well, no, 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 that's part of it because we we could not render this stuff. Yeah, yeah. We basically did not have, and then this is where Unreal comes in and, oh, hey, we want more shots. It's not like, well, that's 10 hours of frame because, yeah. for, you know, we need really smooth motion blur for this or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I, do you want to um, show them kind of like, yeah, let know, me show the, like the, the stuff that we've been doing with the, uh, with yeah. the AR kit and kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. So on this project, we, we knew a few things. Number one, the Nino took us almost four years to do. We didn't have that luxury. But we also knew, as Tran was just saying, that we didn't have to deal with rendering because we were doing this all in Unreal. Honestly, that's the only reason why we could get this done in the, in the planned amount of time that we have. The other thing is we were like, let's change this up. Like, we know... It's going to be a small, a smaller story. We know it's all basically humanoid characters. For the most part, we have one anteater that gets killed. Um, how can we get this done? Uh, so the first thing is obviously we don't have a big budget to do this. We're like, we have to do this all with motion capture, which by the way, it's supposed to arrive any minute. So I might have to jump up at any minute to literally get it from the door. A motion capture suit and gloves and the helmet uh literally any second now i've been looking at this thing all the morning uh so that's one thing we were like we have to do this with motion capture or else we're never going to get this done and we need to do some sort of motion capture with the face so we started looking at a lot of technology and we're going to get into this later but like we saw um 
this company called uh, Mocap X, and Mocap X is using a, a technology that Apple bought, if I'm correct, which is which they implemented into the AR kit. And basically, it's they've come up with a way of 3D tracking your face and generating. You have to generate 52 different shapes, and they they have to be named a certain way. So you can see like no sneer right, no sneer left, you know, mouth up or up left and whatnot. And you just go through this and you have 52 shapes. And from these 52 shapes, it's able to generate all kinds of other uh, expressions by mixing this one with this one and this one. Right. So it's pretty incredible because at a, at a place like Tippett, and I know Chris knows this very well. We're, we were used to doing like 600 blend shapes or more per character. So now it's brought down to 60 up uh, to 52 shapes. You don't have the same amount of control, but we're going to talk about that later. But uh, this would 3D track on your face in real time. Through and your phone, right? Through your phone, which is this is the only technology that you would need. And it would generate the performance uh, that you have here. It's not perfect. You're not, there's no way you're going to get this and create something as beautiful like as Thanos, right? That takes a lot more work and everything. But we knew that the style we chose was made a certain way in particular to work around the limitations. That's why the eyes don't have subsurface scattering. The face doesn't have subsurface scattering. And, and uh, that's why it's so stylized. That's why it's so stylized. Yeah. If I actually jump to this one over here and I just start playing this, uh, that's why we went with the stylized look. And there's still a little jerkiness to some of the AR kit stuff. We were like, you know what? Let's not fight that. Let's make it look even choppier. Let's go in and delete every other keyframe. Let's set it to step tangents so it has a pop to it. But all of it is based off of these 52 uh, shapes from the AR kit. So it's pretty, pretty incredible stuff. So when once we knew, like, okay, this is what we think we want to go in, that's when we reached out to Chris and we were like, hey, would you do these 52 shapes? I, I think you did more shapes on the Nino than just 52 shapes for some of these characters, right? I think some of them had like 400. <laughs> <laughs> Which is incredible. I mean, that's 400 shapes and it's literally in, um, in one shot. So yeah. uh, we, we yeah. probably could have just shot modeled the whole Adam like, if we wanted yeah. to. Yeah, um, the one thing the, the one thing that I, makes me feel not so guilty of is that Chris did use that, like he was saying, to jump over to digital domain and end up doing cool stuff like the Thanos and uh, uh, the other Infinity War characters. Is it Infinity War? It was Infinity War. Uh, both. So Infinity War and Endgame. Um, yeah. So on, on Endgame, it was mostly just taking the you know the old Thanos to the the burned Thanos face model. Um, so we did a, like a, a separate puppet for that. Um, but yeah. other than that, I think that was the, the biggest change for Infinity War. I mean, uh, end, end game, I, th I think. That's yeah. been a while. Um, but yeah, that's exactly why, you know, I ended up doing so many shapes on those creatures was just so I could use that for myself as a, you know, a leverage point. Um, which was super helpful. Um, so awesome. I highly recommend if you have opportunities like that, you know, even if you're doing, you know, free work, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily do free work all the time, but if it's something that's definitely going to get your foot in the door or help you get, you know, to where you want to go, you know, the, the reward is, is definitely worth it. Um, yeah. This is what I tell the students in terms of free work. Bring it over here. Uh, look at what we literally just got in the mail. Boom. Motion capture suit and gloves. All the way from the Netherlands. Ooh. So anyway, so what I would say is in terms of doing any free work, I think the rule is never do more, never do more free work than what the, the, the person that is asking you to do the free work has already done. If somebody goes, hey, I have an idea. I need you to do free work. Fuck your idea. 
But if they go, look, these are the concepts we have. We already did a bunch of models. Here's a bunch of shots. We shot a bunch of stuff. These are the actors. These are the sets we built. These are the costumes we built. They're like, oh, these people are really going to get it done. But if you somebody just asks you to do free work just based off an idea, you're screwed because there's well, a big possibility that they're not going to get it done. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not – that's just what I've noticed from – even friends of mine that are like, oh, I'm getting people to help me out. And then I'm like, I look at the stuff. I'm like, dude, you realize that's a lot of work. And then they end up dropping two it's, years into the project. Yeah. And it's also what it is too. It's uh, their passion projects. It's different. Yeah. Yeah. Not like yeah. coming from a big studio yeah. that has but anyway, all this yeah. resource. Yeah. But anyway, I wanted to to pass this on to Chris so that Chris can show um, his process. Uh, this is like a huge treat for you guys. Yes. I, bl blend shapes and shot modeling and, and facial shapes. It's like the black art of visual effects. It's something that no one even realizes exists. No one even realizes that someone does it. It's not bragged about enough because a lot of companies like to pretend that it's some proprietary technology that they have when the truth is the reason why Avatar looks as good as it looked was because there was a badass artist uh, at Weta doing that. The reason why Thanos looks badass is because you have an amazing artist like Chris and other people at Digital Domain doing, doing it. So this is a, a big deal, and I thought that that's why it would be so amazing. This is Chris, a treat, so, for yeah. sure. Yeah, so Chris, if you want to take over and just show... Uh, Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think what I'm going to try and, and show you guys today is kind of my methodology of how I broke down the work yeah. and, um, you know, how I got everything started. And maybe hopefully I can give you guys some, you know, workflow ideas and like some things that are easy to incorporate into your workflow that will give you a lot of gains. Um, in in many areas uh and and will really help you out i think um and it'll also probably give you i can give you guys some insight of like how to take some of these um ideas and workflows even further beyond what i show you today um so you know why don't we just get started with kind of showing you kind of you know the shapes that i initially built um because they are slightly different than the AR kit. Um, they have, you know, more overall motion in them, and um, they're a little bit more facts-based. And, you know, I can kind of show you, we can, we'll also talk about later how, you know, what are some problems of, of doing it that way and how we're going to kind of tackle them. Um, so let's just quickly go over kind of uh oh why are you not working this maya has been giving me problems oh that works is it just this hmm hold on here why don't we go envelope all right, well, let's see, I'll go to the, so basically what I did first was I combined it all the shapes. Um, so instead of having a left and right, they're, they're just one. I'm not really sure why this thing is so picky. Cause a lot of, all the shapes in, in uh, AR kit want a left side and a right side. Yeah, and I, I don't really wanna have to like model those if I don't, oh wait, I wonder if it's, why is this? I like just installed this Maya last night and it's definitely being a little temperamental. Um, so, you know, for, and it's always also good if, if they have a texture to kind of get that. So you can kind of see what the texture is doing. Cause that's also pretty important. Um, you know, so for, you know, the, the, the brow outer up, which is the, the name of the AR kit shape, um, it's actually a fact shape, which we normally would call um, outer brow razor. Um, so it's it's good to know that a lot of a lot of these these shapes that they have in here are, you know, facts based. 
Do you um, want to tell people what facts are for those that don't know? Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good idea. Um, facts <laughs> is like the facial facial action action coding system, and it basically breaks down all the the faces movements into muscle groups, um, and how those muscle groups kind of work together. Um, a lot of visual effects, you know, houses will use facts as their standard blend shape puppet thing. Um, that's generally the basis, unless you're at like maybe like a, you know, maybe like a feature animation type studio, they'll probably have something that's a little different, um, but still pretty much rooted in the same thing. Um, so let me just kind of go through what some of these, what these ended up looking like. Um, so like we have our inner up, um, and you can see there's like lots of motion, even like the nose is moving. There's actually a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, our, our eye shapes are very, you know, we have just all the look around shapes. So it's like, look left, look right, look down. Um, and then you can see there that, you know, I don't have the, the version that trans fixed up, but. Yes, I have you know, to. I was just thinking that. I'm like, oh, I should have sent that. And, too. and what, what they mean by that is when he, the the character blinks, the textures are stretching. So Tran had to go in and fix the normal. Yeah, maps I mean, in particular. it's different because we're using Unreal. We're using normal maps instead of having all that be more modeled in. Yeah. So then the textures are getting messed up. Yeah, and you know the this. This stuff is also stretching quite a bit as it goes over the eye. Um, so they uh, the actual textures look real good on their model. <laughs> um, so um, you know we have Which cheek squint. Later, yeah. yeah. So like the, the cheek squint here is just kind of like cheek razor. Um, you know we have a brow lower. Um, I love that shape. It, it goes pretty far. You know, one of the things that, you know, was kind of hard at the beginning was the eyebrows are so much high, so further up on the face. You know, you really have to kind of push it all down to kind of be able to read the expression. Um, okay, this one's going to be weird because it's not the right one, and I don't know why it's named improperly. <laughs> like, it's so strange. I'm only having this issue with this Maya. Um, awesome. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's basically jaw forward. Um, you know, then you know we have a smile, and like the good thing is, like on the smile, we're really trying to keep, make sure the lip line and the lip lip texture is is clean and neat and very easily readable. Um, <clears throat> and you know, I also kind of tried to stylize it a little bit. I don't know if I'm quite at trans acceptable <laughs> level yet, but like, eh, it's a work in progress. Uh, you know, one of the, the challenging things is trying to get, like, the stylization of the shapes to work kind of with the character um, versus being, you know, too fleshy or, or too real looking. Um, you know, so this is our lip presser. Um, let's see, what's this one? Our lower lip down. Um, let's see here. And we have our, our mouth up shape. Our stretcher. Uh, let's see, we got frown. I'll probably push that further. Um, you know, dimpler. You know, we got look up, look out, which is actually look right. We've got the wide eyes. You know, for the wide eyes, always if you know you're you're working on shapes, remember to kind of expose the top of the the iris. If if it's not exposing that, then you probably just got to go further. Um, we have we have so, a few questions, Jeremiah and Elijah. We'll, we'll, we'll get to them at the end. Let me just let Chris finish up. Sure. Yeah. Um, so then you know we got a squint and a blink, and you know if if I turn off this, you can kind of see the, you know, they're not really you know the the maps are kind of what's making that look a little little weird. But that's normal, right? So, and then R is, did we not? Funneler. Um, and I, you know, these heads are asymmetrical. So there's definitely, you know, you know, Tran and Miguel really kind of like to keep a lot of that asymmetry if possible. Um, so I, I'm constantly kind of going in here and kind of tweaking things to be a little bit less, a little bit more irregular. 
and and stylize. But like I said, it's it's still a, a definite work in progress. <laughs> um, so you know we got a pucker. Let's see here. This would be basically your chin razor, chin razor upper lip. They call this mouth shrug. Um, I don't think the snow sneer works. I don't know why it does that. And that, oh wait, where's the jaw drop? Here you are. So we have a jaw drop, you know, we still have, you know, you can kind of still get the, the sense that there's a, a, a jawbone underneath there. Um, you know, the ears are kind of popping in behind the, the jawbone as it moves out of the way. Um, pretty cool. Uh, let's see. So then we have like lip suck basically, or, or lip roll in. Um, you can kind of see that there's, you know, you're getting kind of little dimples and things like that that are coming in. Um, harder to read with the texture on, but there are some little bits of realistic stuff in there. Um, you know, and that's really pretty much it for the most part. You know, these shapes, I'm only doing half, right? So, like, I'm basically splitting the face after the shapes are built. Um, now, he says that's it, but can you run, can you turn on wireframe mode and then just run through some of them again? Yeah, yeah, sure. No because one of the things that a lot of people get wrong with blend shapes is they try to localize the movement to just the mouth. And then it ends up looking like a Muppet because when you do these expressions, everything is moving in your face. From In some cases, you can see even some of the ears are, are moving. The nose is moving. Certain things that you wouldn't even think should be affected are being affected. And that's the difference between a really good face shape modeler and uh, an amateur. Well, an amateur also doesn't respect the form, right? It's all of a sudden... Yeah. Like it's it's break, breaking the facial structure. Like the, it's yeah. turning into bubble gum or something like that. When we did the face shapes at Tippet, there was an animation supervisor, a friend of mine called uh, William Groby. He's an amazing filmmaker and amazing animator. And he would say, turn on every blend shape at once and turn it on and off, on and off. And he would look for dead areas. And he's like, I need life here. And he would yeah. want to make sure that if every blend shape was on, Every part of the face should be tugged at some point. That's with every shape on. I mean, it, the blend shape would look terrible, but everything had to have life to it. And that's something that, you know, I see there. Like everything has a tug. Everything has a pull. You're feeling stuff underneath because everything is, is stretching, which is great. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, when I started out doing shapes, the first puppet i ever made was horrible like i think I, I eventually got a note back from animation that was like can we just get better shapes <laughs> like so you know <laughs> don't don't let those things like scare you like if, if you've never done it before like it it's definitely you will get better um you know so it's just like the first human i ever made where it was like what is that you're like, it's a human, you can't tell. And it's like, no. So, you know, Worst don't. Kind of like, <laughs> we just can get you it better. Do it just less suck. <laughs> uh, so, you know, like if, if, if blend shapes are something that you're interested in or you want to get better at, like the best way to do it is just to start doing it. And yeah, I still make stuff that doesn't look good. Like it, it happens. Um, it's all part of the process. So, but also having um, having a good background, just being a good sculptor too, right? Yeah, it, it is super helpful. Um, you know, and I, I think also having a little bit of technical knowledge um, will also kind of help you um, quite a bit. Um, and one of the reasons I tend to, I do all my shape work in Maya. And, you know, the only reason I do that is because Maya gives me more tools than any other package does for this process. Um, you know, I have a timeline, I have deformers, I have clusters, I can do collisions, I can do almost anything you want, right? Um, and sometimes, depending on the show, like, your approach will be different. Um, like, on this show, um, you know, it's, we're using the AR kit, there's only 52 shapes, you know, it's stylized, and, you know, those, all those things, to me, say, 
probably don't need in-betweens. We probably don't need a lot of motion breakup in to the in-betweens. Um, and a lot of it we can just get away with single linear shapes. And, you know, I think later we'll talk about we have run into some issues with that um, and, and how we kind of solved that with the AR kit um, as well. So, I mean, Miguel, does anybody have any questions now or should so there's just a keep few going? Questions uh, real quick. Uh, question number one from Jeremiah. Uh, how do you not get burnt out with these project passion projects? Are they done outside your work hours? So it's different answers for different people. This is what we do full time. Uh, Noman has put us in a good opportunity to be able to say that, which is insane. So shout out to Noman, Alex Alvarez, who's our, you know, he's our, 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 uh, I guess biggest savior. patron. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in terms of Chris, uh, how do you not get burnt out with these fashion products? Um, you know, I, I normally don't do any freelance work, um, really for anybody. It doesn't really matter who it is. Um, because it, it is too much really for the most part. Um, you know, when I was younger in my career, I could work all the time, but you know, now it's like work is work. And, you know, when you get home and you start to do like a sculpt in ZBrush or something, it feels more like work than fun, if that makes any sense. Um, but you know, when Miguel and Tran, you know, asked me if I wanted to help out. Like, like one thing about working with Miguel and Tran is like, they are, in my opinion, two of the hardest working, you know, people in this industry. And the amount of passion that they have is something that I really connect with. And I'll, if there's something that I can do to help them out in any way, and I can squeeze it in, I'll definitely make that ex exception because I think. You know, working with them is, is is super fun. You know, everything they're doing is always very creative. And I know that, like, if I'm going to help them, that, like, the final product will be delivered and it will look good. Um, and that kind of touches on Miguel's point about, you know, working for free and, you know, working for people that, you know, aren't really going to be able to get stuff done. And, you know, with Miguel and Tran, it, it's pretty much the opposite of that, right? So it's like... I want to support them in any way that I can, if I have the ability to do that at the time. Um, and, you know, things that kind of piqued my interest in this project, aside from, you know, helping them out, um, is just kind of learning more real-time processes. And I, I think those are definitely somewhere where, you know, a lot of the industry is going to be going. And, you know, it's definitely good to kind of get your feet wet and get some experience in there and kind of see what it's all about. Um, so, you know, normally like, you know, doing, you know, regular work and, and stuff off hours is, is pretty tough. I don't generally recommend it. Um, you can get burnt out pretty quick, but this project also isn't super labor intensive. Like it's not like, Hey, we want you to build a fax puppet with 900 shapes. Then I would probably be like, uh, oh, that's a lot of work. You know, um, Chris would disappear off Facebook <laughs> mysteriously all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so, yeah. Um, you know, Ask that's at the end of the project, though. He might have a different response. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely possible. Uh, last <laughs> question, and then I think we should keep the questions to the end. Is it better to close the eyelids during the modelist, modeling stage or keep them open? I that prefer also to keep them to open. the mouth, by the way. Yeah. Keep them I prefer to I, keep them open um, because. <laughs> when they're open that's the look of your model at rest or default and i always want to see that connection of what what does this character actually look like and what are they going to look like in the show um and if their eyes are either closed or half like half closed it, i don't know i i just i would just prefer them open i don't know about you guys but yeah no i agree uh really quick these last two uh do you guys see Unreal Engine as a staple program in the film industry? I absolutely see yes. it taking over. Big time. And then uh, David, my good friend David from Noman, not sure if someone asked yet, but did you guys build a face couple manually? Yes, 100%. Um, normally, like what we did in Ningyo, I might make something, I pass it to Chris, and then Chris would look at it and be like, you know, Trian, this area kind of sucks. And I'd be <laughs> like, okay, just do whatever you want to do. 
Yeah. Um, in this case, it didn't work out that way. We put we pushed into rigging, and then Chris had to work with whatever I gave him. But um, <laughs> it worked out. Like we were able worked, to we were it, able to get it to work. It worked out, yeah. but there were there were areas. <laughs> there there, <laughs> there were sorry, questionable Chris. areas that you know, in my opinion, could you know be a little better. But yes. so normally they, yeah, that would have been know. the process. Yeah. And a lot yes, of times you don't realize that stuff until you see the face moving. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's what Chris would know right away, right? Like if you specializing in oh, this, you yeah. just look at topology yeah. and know exactly what's wrong and what you need. I don't yeah. do this, that type of work that Chris does. So I don't know right away. You right? know, like for me, like if I'm working with other people, a lot of times I'll just do some shapes and then send them examples. So we have something that we can both look at and talk about. Um, that way everybody can kind of see like, hey, this loop, maybe we need more here or move it here or whatever it is. But, you know, we are also easily able to make it work, right? So, yeah, well, it, um, it's, it's normal to also in a, in a being a situation when you go back and forth and you work at, with someone who has more knowledge and you go, OK, so I need to do this and that. And that's that's what it means to be in a team. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, teamwork is really like a lot of these efforts. It's it, no one person can do it. You know, it's it takes a team um, really to to make amazing things. Um, so, 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 yeah, let's leave all the, the rest of the questions to the end. You guys could ask, but I'm not going to interrupt Chris until the end. So just all right. go ahead. So and let's let's get into some some interesting things and not interesting things um so i figured i'd just go over kind of the basics of the shape editor um you probably most people probably already know um but in this case for this this project i'm kind of relying on just maya's stock stuff normally i would use something like um you know simplex from blur their their blend shape editor is amazing um i highly recommend downloading it and compiling it but that's for a different different time. So in the blend shape editor, normally I'll just create a blend shape and then just add a target. And we can call this, you know, we'll call it Parker. Um, and then, you know, I'll basically just, and in feature film, if I was doing like something for Thanos, I probably wouldn't approach it this way. I would probably build all of the motion of the shapes with clusters and timeline sculpting, um, which is, yeah really involved um you know so but this is also a very easy way to do stuff um oh good lord uh oh hold on let me see if my wacom tablet drivers are working properly my wacom drivers are never working properly ever yeah, like mine are always broken and just recently they've been like really bad. Oh, all right, cool. Now we're good. <laughs> um, so, you know, a lot of times, you know, I'll just come in here and just start moving stuff. You know, the move brush is probably the most used brush that I've got uh, or that I use. Let's see where it is. Um, and the brushes all have, like in the tool settings here, you can kind of switch your fall off to surface or volume. I prefer surface a lot of the times. Um, and I usually will just bring down my strength pretty low, like 30%. Um, you know, and then I'll just kind of come in here and just quickly start bringing the mouth closer. Don't worry, we'll we'll fix a lot of this weird stretching that we're getting with some other tools. Um, so, like right now, I just kind of want to, you know, a lot of times if you're just getting subtle movement, you know, like nice broad fall off for that. You want to make sure that you know the nose is moving, and then you know you also kind of want to contour the face a little bit. Um, and then like always check what's going on with the shape and how it's moving. Um, and this isn't necessarily like a super fast process. So, you know, just be patient with it. Um, 
you know, I'm not going to make anything truly amazing here in the time we have, but um, hopefully I'll be able to show you some workflows that you'll be able to use in your own work. Um, and let's see here. Let's go switch over to volume here so I can just pull that out. And now for anything that's kind of like weird kind of stretching that you're getting from pulling stuff around, this little guy right here, the smooth target brush, actually makes like a delta between this and your rest pose, this and this. So I can come in here and just kind of paint the fall off and it will clean up a lot of the vertices that aren't maybe moving properly or erratically. Um, so now you can kind of see we're starting to not have so much stretching. Um, so this brush is probably the most amazing brush in Maya or Mudbox. Mudbox has the same feature. So um, I actually probably think it came from Mudbox. All this stuff is, is, is taken from Mudbox, yeah. Yeah. It's like Mudbox is amazing at some things, but ugh, some things it is not amazing at. Same with ZBrush. So like I would always say, like, don't get used to using one or the other. Like if I'm at work, sometimes I'll have like Mudbox open and ZBrush open and Maya open working on the same thing, um, just depending on what I'm doing. Um, when I'm modeling, that is. So like here you can kind of see, ugh, ugh, that doesn't look so good. So we can just come back here and just you know do that. Um, so you're you're using what to bring it back. You're masking it back in. No, basically what it's doing is it's creating like a delta that you don't see. Um, how are you brushing it off so that people can see? I'm just I'm just brushing over that area. And basically, if you watch, if we go here to this this lip line here. Um, the more I hit it, the more it's going to try to kind of go back to that position. But what tool is that? A smooth target. Um, it's this little guy right here. Okay. Um, super amazing. Um, like I can't, I can't work without it. You know, I have tools that do this, you know, like a deformer would. Um, but it's, it's pretty amazing that we can do this. And now let me kind of show you another really pro tip here. Um, so, so say we got it this far, but say what if we wanted to utilize a scan in this process as well? Um, you know, we can go grab, you know, a scan here that I wrapped. Let's see if this works. I haven't tried this, so let's see. So what I can do with that smooth target brush is I can change my target source. So now, Your, your mic is off. I didn't want to breathe into the mic, so I oh. <laughs> you can use um, Z-Wrap to wrap the topology? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so they, have identical, they have identical topology. Yes. Yeah. So that's the only thing. So if you don't know how to use WrapX, learn. Um, it, it is amazing. So now we can kind of come in here. And start hey, to can, bring can I interrupt in. for a second? So just so, so everybody knows, it has no idea what what that wrap access. It's a program that allows you to grab two models and basically transfer one topology onto a completely different model. And it's pretty smart about how it transfers everything over. That's why he's able to transfer this shape of this cartoon character, the topology, onto a scan of something that has nothing to do with this character and right now are you using the the, the um smooth target yeah the smooth target brush yeah i am so you can see that if i blend this out now That's you can kind of see how it's it's trying to warp that in um i didn't do like the best job cleaning that scan up because i just i did it this morning like just really quickly um to kind of get that in there so the things that you might find from 
Uh oh, that's not good. My nib of my brush just like went inside the brush. So you can also see that we're starting to lose the original model's form. Um, so what I kind of like to do is kind of, you know, get it to, you know, something similar to the the scan. And then I'll just duplicate this off and we'll pipe it back into the base model here. And now, once we have that piped in, we can now start, you know, working on, wait a minute. Oh, crap. Hold on. That's a fail on my part. Let me go back. Turn that off. There we go. There we go. So now we can kind of come in here. And now we have, you know, a bit more realism in the lips. And now we can take that smooth target brush and kind of start to like lightly push back some of the forms. So they, they kind of, you know, line up um, and work better with the old model. Since we're blending from like a completely different source, it might shift things a little too much. So I like to come back and kind of just lightly find that area that's kind of between the two models to where the deformation of this one looks good, but I'm still getting little bits of the details that I brought in from the scan, um, if if that makes any sense. Um, totally. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, and you know, the, the reason I'm kind of showing you this is because this works incredibly well for making combos between two shapes you know, cleaning other shapes up. Like, what if I had, you know, this model, and then I had, like, a completely different model here. And one model had, like, clean lips, and the insides of the mouth were real nice. You can blend into that one and kind of bring over some of those other forms to clean the model up. Um, you know, and it's it's super helpful. The, the other really good thing about this that I always tell um almost anyone but you know especially kind of junior junior artists that this is one way that you can you know make a sculpt in zbrush and and just say you're mo modeling a head right you can kind of model it in zbrush and then if you want to bring in elements of a scan of like maybe cheekbones or anatomy or or subtle forms from the scan and kind of blend them with your model, this is a, a really, really good way to do that without changing the shape of your model. Um, and it, it, it is really fast. Um, and, you know, I think it, especially if maybe you're not the best head modeler or you don't know the best about anatomy, like, I don't think there's any reason why you should always be expected to use 100% of your artistic ability to make something like these tools are here to kind of augment, you know, your workflows with artistic skills and technical skills. And I think this is a really good way of, of leveling up even just your base modeling. Um, if that does that make any sense? Totally, totally makes sense. It's awesome. Um, you know, and then, you know, there we go. We're kind of in the ballpark, right? And that, you know, that took only, I don't know, 10 minutes yeah. um, what i always tell what i always tell students at noman is remember that ultimately your job is like the job of a magician no one cares how you got the effect as long as the effect is, is successful right no one yeah. cares how you achieved it no one cares does it look good does it look real that's it was it look good look real was it done in a reasonable amount of time yeah so yeah you know like one a long time ago i was sent to singapore and to train, you know, artists that have never, like, basically done any 3D before. And, you know, like, the, the first kind of thing I told everyone there is that, like, you know, this isn't school. This is a job. And, 
you know, our job is to get things done as quickly as possible. And I don't necessarily want to see you building a boot if we have a boot in the library that looks something like the boot that you're making. Grab it, adapt it, move on. You know, it's it's one thing to be making your own portfolio, but like if you're just working, just use whatever you leverage whatever you can because that's what's going to give you the edge. Yeah. Um so, you know, this is basically kind of, you know, the one of the main workflows that I would use for this. Um, and I would I would use this type of workflow all over the face, like, um, and it's it's super fast. It's very easy to do. Um, it doesn't take a lot of you know too much knowledge on you know a lot of people's. It's real easy to pick up. Um, you know, so let's see what else can we talk about. You know, I kind of want to talk about you know once we have you know, our shape list. Um, I kind of want to talk about maybe ways of splitting your shapes and how we can get those shapes onto a different body, for example. Or how can we get these shapes here onto the full body mesh that Miguel and Tran need for their the, the next step in their process. So the first thing that you should always remember is if you're not familiar with splitting shapes, um, really the main trick of splitting shapes is that you're using a normalized weight map. And what that really means is like you don't mirror the weight map, you invert the weight map. So basically when those two shapes get split and dialed in together, they will equal one or they'll equal their pre-split shape exactly. Um, and if you don't do it that way, it won't work. Um, so let me kind of show you what I mean here. And I'll kind of show you the shape editor way of doing it, which is eh, not very scalable. Um, but then I, we can also kind of talk about other processes where we can utilize the same thing and make it more scalable. Um, so, and when I mean scalable, I mean doing these things on large lists of data. So splitting 900 shapes at once or exporting all these things out it, you know, it's, but you got to start simple first. So the easiest way to describe this is I will just paint this guy here, this, this blend shape mask. And over here, we'll just kind of smooth this out. So now we kind of have you know, our pucker on the right. And if we come in here and look in the tool settings. How did you get to, how did you get to the blend shape mask so people could see? Oh yeah, so it's right here. So if you just look right here, it's right next to the eraser button. Um, I think that's the eraser button. Actually, I don't know if that's the eraser. No, it's the eraser. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, you just click on this little guy, it'll bring up a mask. now. The thing that limits the power of this that they've implemented in Maya is it's stored per shape, not the whole shape node. So you have to like you would have to paint this on every shape individually, which makes it eh, not that great. But it's very easy for me to kind of show you the the how it works. And so in here they have an invert mask button. So I can hit that and now I have the Your left side. side. Yeah. So, you know, now the poor man way of doing this would be just duplicate out, you know, each side and rename it. And then when they both go back into the mix, they will equal that shape that you just made that's symmetrical. Um, it's very clever. Yeah, it's 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 very smart, smart way to work. Right. So the the way that I could kind of show you that could make this get you around this, um, or maybe I can give you some ideas of how to get around this, um, is instead of using the this masking option, um, and like this splitting workflow has been around for forever. Um, you know, if you ever, you know, bought any of those books, um, Stop Staring, they have a, you know, a blend taper script that does this. Um, Unfortunately, they don't have it. It doesn't work in any of the latest Mayas unless you like know how to code and fix it. Um, but uh, let's see here. So 
basically what instead of using this, I'm going to use the Maya paint blend shape. So if we come if we right click on our mesh and come down to paint, you'll see a blend shape option in here, base weights. So you can select that and now we can basically do kind of the same thing. Get in, no, no, get, no. Ugh, this brush is not, not the best, Maya, come on. Um, so for example, we'll just do it this way. Boop, 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 boop. Now we can come back into the, the tool settings here and we can switch from to smooth and we can just flood smooth the, in the, the, the area there. And now you can see same effect, right? But you could store this for every shape. Yeah. So that's the thing, right? So now you could write a script that will take this and it will apply it to every shape. Um, the same map, and then it will basically run. Let's, I don't this. I have a script here. Let's see if it will will actually do it. This script is super finicky. Boom. So basically, it inverts the the blend shape weight. Um, so basically, what what that script would end up doing is basically every shape in your list, it would copy that blend shape weight onto everything. Well, it's actually on the top blend shape no not an individual um, shape so like if we look in here and we go we have target like weights that actually live on individual targets or on the global blend shape node so basically what the script would basically say is copy this map duplicate out one side invert the map duplicate out the other side automatically rename it for you with uh, you know a left or a right at the end of the name and it will just rip through the whole list um you know so that would be one way of scaling this process um and you know you don't necessarily have to just split things left and right you could split the upper lip from the lower lip for example um there's there's all a whole bunch of different ways you can now dice the face up into different regions so you know say you have like your platismas you know like here and you wanted to paint out each one so they're all individual this is how you would do it um and if you didn't do it this way you would have to make a bunch of combos to make it all look good together which kind of seems like more work and i don't really like more work um you Combos might have to do meaning, that, but... meaning like a shape that goes on top of everything that is running simultaneously. So it knows if you're running shape A, B, and C, this runs on top of the, the three of yeah. them to make it look better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this concept is, to me, I would think it is a very important concept um, in general. Yeah, um, and, you know, this will kind of, allow you to not have to do both sides you know um if the model is symmetrical you may have to right eh, that's part of the game but you know if you don't have to don't do it it's more work um and just remember like a lot of guys out there or girls listening to this uh 52 shapes you're like oh left side right side is not a big deal but once you go work at a company and you're doing 600 shapes being able to cut that in half is a huge time saver yeah, like, well, I, I can't tell you how much you would hate your job if you had to do it by hand. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, so if you're not super savvy at scripting, just make sure you got a really good friend that is. <laughs> you know, you give him a 12 pack of beer and you're like, hey, man, can you just write this for me real quick? And he'll be like, <laughs> I'll, I'll, need, I'll need 12 more sense. beers. Yeah. And then you're like, done. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. So that's that, right? Um, awesome. You know, so let me see here. So like one of the thing I kind of want to quickly talk about is um, 
while we were doing this process, we noticed that like our results in the AR kit our eyelids were crashing through the eyeballs because we don't have in-betweens, yeah. right? And, you know, we kind of were like, Ugh, how do we do this? Um, and it turns out, like, the AR kits, like, or the, the, the um, mocap, mocap X, yeah, excuse me, is, you know, very smart in that it just takes, or very simple, I should say, it just takes connections, and we can actually add those in-betweens into the shape editor, and then make those connections and it will pick up the, the in-betweens. Yeah. Um, so I kind of want to show you like a really easy way of doing the eye in-betweens. Um, if I was, you know, kind of in a feature film setting, I would probably, you know, use lots of clusters and make sure that like corners are moving and there's all this kind of crazy complex motion in here. But for this, all we really need is an arc on the lid so that it doesn't crash through the eyeball. Um, and there's there's a simple plugin out there um, that will allow you to do this. Um, it's called Radial Blend Shape. Um, it's been around forever. Um, I always kind of use it for very simple types of of uh, models, or or types of like the style of of what what we're going for. Um, we'll kind of inform you on which which way you might which workflow you might want to use. Um, so here I'm just extracting these faces just so I can find um, the center of the eye. So now I have, you know, if I go back to my, I have like a center point, right? And let's just grab the shapes here. Oh, damn, my cat is hungry. Get now. I'll feed you in a minute. You get out of here. <laughs> like he's he's just so needy. When he wants something, he will not leave you alone. <laughs> like, good lord. Oh crap! No, I only want that's Koa when she's ninety. <laughs> she looks like the character from uh, Dark Crystal. What's that? Uh... Ooh. The one with the one eye. I haven't seen that movie in so long. The Oracle. All right, so let's check this out. Um, so for this, the eyes need to be separated. So um, I do this after I split them. Um, so the first thing we want to, let's just make sure there's no history on this. Oh, nope, we'll show that later. What's this one? All right, script editor, don't fail me now. Um, so right now I'm just running a, a Python command um, in here to run this. Um, so we get this little GUI here, and what we do is we say get geometry. So that's like our base head. And then we want to create the deformer. And now we want to say add. And what we're going to do is you can kind of name whatever it is, left, right, or I think there's all kinds of names in here. Um, and we'll just say left. And now it gives us this. So right now, it's basically right here where it says set upper closed missing is it's looking for a shape. Um, so we can just select this guy and hit set. And now what it did is it gave us a locator or like a little a little deformer group down here at the origin. So what you can do is if you take the lid locator here, and drag this into the center of the eye, it's basically creating a pivot for the blend shape to rotate around. Now, you could also do this same thing with joints. You could use the joint rotation to um, drive the nonlinear um, rotation of the blend shape. So, did you split the eye just so that you have that point? Uh, like no, I just I duplicated those faces, oh, and okay. then just collapsed them to the center. So like I know exactly where where the middle. Yeah, the middle of the eye. So like if I okay. let me, I'll I'll quickly show that again here. 
It's just like a placeholder, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's all it is. And if it was like a straight sphere, I wouldn't need to do it this way. Oh, did I actually cut it out? Oh, I cut it out. Well, <laughs> my my bad. Don't do that. Uh, you know, just like, you know, duplicate these faces and then just extrude and collapse so it gives you the center. Now, you know, if your eye was round, you could just show the... Um, bit locations of it through the attribute editor but since this one's got a cornea bulge on it we can't it won't really fire or the, the, con next. the control handle i guess you could also do that. yeah so now if we select this guy and so you can kind of see we're getting like a little crinkly crinkle there we just have to rotate this out um and now we now have this blend shape traveling around that axis um, instead of linearly just crashing through. So now to take this one step further, how do we get our in-betweens? Um, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my timeline from 0 to 10. Uh, and then I'm going to key this guy um, here and then on at 1. Right, so now we can see that you know we don't have that crashing anymore, and you know the blend shape is still basically this pretty much the same shape that we had. Um, so now to take this one step further and give us the actual in betweens, um, I've got you know this. You can probably find one of these online somewhere. I had a buddy that gave me this. Um, his name is uh, Mauricio Mamoli. Amazing. TD and facial modeler. Um, but basically, so in here, I can basically specify what I want the shapes to be called once they get split into in-betweens. And then I can basically give this the frame range that I want it to run over, which is 0 to 10, and the number of incrementals, which is could be 2, 4, 6, whatever. Um, and then you know, one other thing that we want to make sure before you split these out is make sure your curve is linear in the animation curve uh, because if it's not it's going to cause problems um, interpolation problems with other shapes um, so always just linearize your curve here in the graph editor then all you got to really do is just select this guy and hit bake and we now have you know our our eye blink 25 50 75 and 100 so it did yep. all the naming for you yep mm -hmm. and these the 25 50 75 100 are the the incrementals in the blend shape editor sure. right so you want it at 0 0.25 0 0.5 and 0 0.75 um, and then you know with these we're pretty much done so we can just export those out and bring those in um just in just so people know why that's the way that is why you have to do in betweens is blend shapes are linear shapes so they don't have an arc to them at all so when you do a blend shape the eye obviously has a roundness to it it just tries to go from here and just go straight down kind of it's not going to get the feeling of it yeah, going it across an arc it doesn't know what shape to make in between before it gets yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it's a good way of explaining it so by having these different places, it knows to get from here to here, from there to there, from there to there, and then from the final thing. So it's still linear from each point to the other point. Yeah. But it basically, it's like a, it's, it's more of an arc than it was before. And if you, if this wasn't linear, when you're baking out these tangents, 0.25, if there's an arc in the curve, won't be at the same spot um if that if that makes any sense so it won't truly be 0.25 it'll be like an ease in so it might technically be at like you know 0.15 or, yeah. or 0.13 or something like that right so that's why you want to make sure that animation curve isn't you know altering where that shape is on the timeline um and i've learned that the hard way <laughs> that curve basically means smooth in, so it's going to yeah, like easy in, easy out. Yeah, so and yeah. then it's going to yeah, so it's not perfect. exactly, exactly. Um, 
So, <clears throat> so that's you know, kind of that. You know, how much time do we have left? Um, I kind of <laughs> we're, uh, you know, I, I know this is kind of like a, a broad overview. So like, I'm not getting into too many things that are like really deep in there. There's so many more things we could talk about, but um, now I think I kind of want to show you guys like how I would go about, you know, getting those those split targets or the targets that are on just the head cut onto the final body. Um, and the reason I, I cut the head off is because it's just less polys and easier to work with. Um, you know, these models are pretty light, but like, say you're working on like a film character that's, you know, 200,000 polygons, right? And your face is 90,000. You, you don't want to be making 400 blend shapes on a mesh that's 200,000 polygons. Like, it's, it's pretty crazy. It'll Because ultimately, be... it's carrying all of that geometry. It's just hidden, but it's still there. Yeah, and it, it, it'll slow everything down, and you're not going to like it. It's going to be kind of a painful process. Yeah. So let's take a look at how we can do this. Um, there's multiple ways that we can do this. Um, let's see here. Let's get rid of these. Uh, 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 uh. Ooh, what do you do? Oh, let's keep it. Do, 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 history. So now, let's just get rid of that locator. Let's get rid of the whole group. Let me bring in the Koa body. So for this process, I'm going to use a wrap deformer. Um, we could use other deformers as well. We can do a UV wrap if we wanted to. Um, but for this, we'll just use a wrap deformer because the one nice thing that, well, I shouldn't say the one nice thing, that sounds horrible. <laughs> but like the one good thing that Tran did, which I normally I wouldn't do, <laughs> but like Tran does everything. I'm making this sound so bad. Um, but like she separated, there's a little gap between the lips. And like so normally what? I'm like, I'm That's like, one good thing you did, the what? <laughs> I'm, I'm never going to live this down. I'm sorry. Um, um, is that there's a gap, right? So like if your lips were like all crashed together, you would have to basically open the jaw a little bit to uncrash them, wrap the head onto that, and then close it. So as the wrap deformer goes through each shape, it does. it's not tangled. If that makes sense, because it looks for the closest vertice, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So really, for this process, let's just grab. Let me just throw some shapes on here, so we can kind of see what that looks like. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, wait, what? Oh, full body shapes. That's why. Dope. Okay, so now we've got got some shapey shapes on here, and let's unhide this guy. So, if we select the the full body, and then the head cut, and we come up to uh, deform, wrap. What I would do here is reset these settings and turn on exclusive bind. So what that means is like it's going to grab that point one to one. There's going to be no fall off. And I remember originally when I sent uh, Miguel these shapes, he's like, the body's like jiggling all over the place. And basically what happened is I didn't have – there was some sort of threshold turned on, and it was not calculating the wrap properly. Um, the body was dancing literally. Yeah, it was like – <laughs> The face looks good, but the body was like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so make sure exclusive bind is checked. Um, and then you can just hit apply. And if you did it correctly, the, the first selection should be selected. The first selection. Now we can kind of come in here and go down our blend shape node and, you know, duplicate these out, right? That would be the manual way. Duplicate it out, rename it. Now, if you wanted to make this process more scalable, what you could do is basically have a script uh, written that would basically 
you would basically have like a, a little box that said, what mesh do you want to export? And you say the full body. And then you, you kind of you tell that script which blend shape node do you want it to export from. So basically what you're going to do, what you would end up doing is copying the blend shape node from here, blend shape one. And then basically what the script would do is turn on every one of these one at a time, but export out this mesh and rename it to the name of that blend shape. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a, a convoluted type of process, but really all it, all it allows us to do is bake everything over, copy it all out to a directory, everything's named correctly, and we're on the new mesh. Um, now, if you're doing it by hand, this is how you would, the, the poor man's way would be copy, duplicate, name, copy, duplicate, name, pretty labor intensive. Um, it's, it's labor intensive. The, the other thing I've, I've found with this kind of process when you're doing 50 to 100 of, of, of anything is that you can just screw up so easily. Not the Ooh. naming is not such a big deal, but sometimes it is. AR kit actually, if you bring it into Unreal, the name has to be exactly the same. So you put one thing with the wrong capital, one thing with the lowercase, it doesn't find it anymore. So you're doing a dozen, 50, 60, 100 shapes, 600 shapes, like Chris was saying, 700 shapes. You you could screw stuff up easily. Yeah, I, I've done it before. Yeah, I mean, I did it on the first set of shapes that I sent you. <laughs> <laughs> Technically speaking, so um, yeah. you know, like these types of tools, like any large visual effects studio will probably have something like this already written for you. So um, you know, but it is if you're if you're knowledgeable at scripting, it's you know, I it's pretty easy from what i've been told yeah. um <laughs> so I, you have someone write the help like you get someone else is writing these scripts to yeah yeah uh, if it's me yes like if <laughs> i had to write it like sometimes i don't spell my name properly so like yeah I, I need i need someone that's a little more help from someone that's like a little bit more tech savvy than i am <laughs> like um which is weird because I can do a lot of stuff in Maya and ZBrush and Mudbox. And well, what you're doing is stuff. also very technical, but it yeah. is. Yeah. I know um, what you mean. I can't fill out a form. Yes. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. Um, so that's kind of how that whole process would work. And, you know, just by kind of describing what this is, hopefully it can kind of give you some ideas. Like if you, you know, want to try and learn some of this stuff on your own, you, you have some ideas of, how things could work and how things you could probably figure out pretty easily how to write something like this from what i've been told um from my buddies but if you have to du duplicate it and rename it then that's what you got to do that's yeah fine. you know like turn on the headphones and just power through it in like an hour like yeah. it'll suck and that is but... how much i basically work <laughs> <laughs> As soon as you said if you have a scripting, I immediately I was like, all right, so we would have to manually do it. Yeah, and that's that's how <laughs> I get through most of my stuff. It's just um, a lot of intense manual labor. Yeah. yeah, but if you have lots of friends that just like a lot of us facial people all know each other, um, and You're in a club, <laughs> it's it's a small club, but like it, remarkably, a lot of us all run in the same circles, so. You know, it's real easy to be like, hey, dude, you got something for this? And he'll be like, oh, yeah, I got a script for that here. Uh, I've been using it for years. And, you know, a lot of us will share different tools and things like that. Um, you know, so awesome. keep them handy. You'll never know when you when you lead them. Um, so, you know, that's kind of that process. Now, I kind of want to show you guys how to transfer shapes. Um, so say you have a different character like we do here on this show um you know we've got this other fella right here and we kind of don't really want to do all the shapes over again um if we don't have to so what we can do is just transfer all of her shapes onto her 
Wait, are, yeah, they're both girls, obviously. Um, and I can show you like a real easy way of doing that, as well as you know, it it is also a how do I say this? A very scalable way to transfer things from non-topologically the same objects. So I don't necessarily need this mesh and this and that mesh to be the same. Um, excuse me. But we do need a common correspondence between the two, which we're going to use the UV set for. Um, so if they're topologically different, what you would need to do is in wrap, wrap the the one model to the other one and do a world space UV transfer um, so that the UVs are basically the same. Um, but in this case, our models are the same. They do have different UV sets. Um, so let's take a look at those. So we've got that and we've got that. So if we try to do a UV wrap deformer bind on this, it'll work. But all of these edges that don't match, we're going to end up getting like little weird, some weird things going on. Um, so basically, all we really got to do is just trans like sync these up. Um, you know, just use transfer attributes. Um, mm -mm -mm -mm. Where are you? And I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with transfer attributes, but it basically just allows you to transfer you know, a bunch of different things. And, but one thing that's really awesome is, you know, actual transferring vertex position through UVs. But that's not what we're gonna do here. We're just gonna copy the UV set over um, to the other one. Let's see here. There we go. So now our UVs are the same. So, mm -mm -mm. Let's just delete history on these guys. Boom. OK. So let's load up. And you know, for this process, make sure the model that you're transferring to or exporting is at their zero position. Because as soon as you export these out as OBJs, if it's you know over here, then you're kind of boned and you got to go back and do it all over again because they're in the wrong space. I only say that because it's happened to me before. Um, let's see here. So let's grab all of these shapes from Koa. And where is, I don't know. We'll just do this, load all those guys in here. Let's just make sure they work. That's yep. just a simple apply blend shape. Yeah, just grab the targets, apply them. So now oh, I use oh, this. Yeah. I use this uh, tool called um, UV Blend Shape, uh, SE UV Blend Shape. Um, you can get this online. I think it's like twenty bucks. Yeah, like totally bucks. worth it. Like. I would like if you're interested in this sort of thing. Like this thing is. Oh, killer. Um, so to start this, we want to create the, the UV blend shape on the character we're going to. So we'll just call it. Chris, sorry, sorry to answer. What's it, what's it called? UV. S-E. -E. Like lowercase S-E. Uh -huh. Uppercase UV blend shape. Um, I think his name's Scott. He's on Gumroad. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just going to put, put it up there so that people keep going. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I would definitely buy it if I was you. Um, so now we have the deformer on, uh, what is this, Ala? Is it Ala? Ala, yeah. 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 And now basically what we want to do is select this guy and we hit add target. So basically this guy is like a blend shape getting pumped into this guy. But now you can see that it's asking to bind to a UV map. And if you have multiple UV maps, you can select which one you want. Um, and then it'll give you a tolerance to whatever that UV map is. Um, so then you just hit OK. So it's, it's made that mapping for us. And if we come over here, we now have this transfer 
um, set up here, and we can kind of just keep offset basically like if these shapes are not like in the same space, it's not going to like move your model at all. Um, so just say keep offset and co a body, and this is the basically what's porting the blend shapes over. So now if we come in here, let's kind of move these guys close together um, so we can kind of see. Let's go to the mouth funnel. So we now have you know, basically all of our shapes now being ported over to the other model. Um, and at this point, you could transfer your original UVs back onto it. Absolutely. And retained yeah. the best of both worlds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here's another interesting thing that, like, not all of the shapes are going to come over, like, amazing. Like, if you spend a lot of time on the wrap, really lining up the features properly, um, you know, it, you can get better results. But sometimes we'll sit and tweak this process for a week, like trying to get like the best result. But it's, um, you know, it, it is what it is, but it's definitely a huge time saver. Um, and then this process would be kind of, you know, the same type of steps as what I've been talking about previously. Like we can now basically you know, use this blend shape node to duplicate these guys out and put them into a directory if we had, you know, um, you know, a tool for that. Um, or else you can do it by hand, the poor man's way, right? But super, super good way to transfer things. And it's not topologically dependent. So you can copy to this to any mesh you want um, or, or, or any type of blend shape setup um, this way. Um, so, I mean, obviously there's other ways too, right? Like they're matching topology. So you could, you know, just blend shape this one into this one, leave this guy turned on and duplicate all the shapes out, right? You would have the same result. Um, it's just, you can't do it this way if your meshes aren't the same or that way. Um, so now if we wanted to take this, now there's a reason why I do it this way. And it's because now I have a whole bunch of other options that can help me in the process of transferring these. Like I can now, you know, if there's anything that I don't like out of this transfer, uh, let's see which one, like mouth butter maybe, you know, eh, kind of not the best. It's kind of crinkly. We've got some, some gobbly gook here. Well, actually let's make sure the normals aren't locked. Um, so now what I can do is now I can globally turn on deformers like i can grab you know a delta mush on this and i can say i want to paint that you know to areas that i want to smooth out right so can, can you tell people what the delta mush does uh the delta mush does a lot of things um i use it mostly for basically if you apply it on your your base model like your rest position it will try to smooth out and preserve the shape of the model on all vertices that are moving past that 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 rest position. Um, so for example, let's see here, let's just do this. And then let's just kind of smooth that. So now we can kind of we can come in here. Go to Delta Mush. Why are you not working the way you're supposed to? It's because we're doing a demo, I'm sure. 100%. Yeah, that's the rule. Yeah. <laughs> like, it should be smoothing this. Hold on, let me see what, what happens if I turn off displacement. Uh, maybe maybe the displacement was, was killing it. Let's see. Oh, wait. I bet I applied it on the wrong frame. Uh, oh, if you ever want to delete a deformer, um, if you didn't know this, you, I mean, you, you probably do, but let's see here. If you we go to select, select by name, 
you can just copy the deformer name, paste it, run it, and then just hit delete, and it is out of your stack. Um, so let's try putting that delta mush on this. That's very it's, handy. Yeah, it's 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 super handy, especially if you don't want to blow away all your history. Um, da, 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 da. Sorry, I know these are kind of technical things. They they might be boring, but oh, but that's what we want this stream to be. You know, if, oh, boring. if you want to cool. learn how to model a spaceship, there's plenty of places to do yeah. that. Yeah, there is. All right, so let's see. Is this working? Uh, 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 uh. Ah, yeah, now it's working. So you can kind of see that we can now kind of we can selectively go in and. You know, this will it will affect. That saves you know, a lot of time because that's a lot of effort to just kind of put that corner of the mouth back in. Yeah, and I mean this this stays live for the whole puppet, right? So it's going to apply this to everything. So if there's lots of little crinkly areas, it, you know, it'll clean up all the shapes. Um, and you know, if we wanted to take this even one step further, you know, aside from putting a delta mush on here, say you had. I don't know, say you're working on Red Skull and he's like real bony, right? Um, what you can do is you can duplicate this guy. Um, and what if we wanted to put a shrink wrap on this? Let's see if I do this in the right. I might not do this in the right order. So, oh, oh, oh wait, did it go? I don't see it. Oh, wait, no, I don't want that. Hold on. Other way. Maybe. Oh, are my shrink wrap properties? Uh, 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 uh. Let's just reset. Huh. I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> I thought it would. It sh okay, wait. Oh, I think that might be good. I think that's good. Hold on, let's see. So let's just hide this one. Oh, what? Really? Why can I not paint this? What? It's weird that it's putting it in outputs. It shouldn't be putting it there. It should be inputs. Outputs. Why is it? All right. Well, this is a fail. <laughs> like, I don't, uh, you showed me this yesterday, and it was. Broken. I know. <laughs> like it's. Why is it not? That happens sometimes when uh, you're trying to show something. Like it could be the easiest thing sometimes that it I'm trying usually, to show. It usually is. And <laughs> everything is overcomplicated when there's a camera recording you. Let's try getting rid of this delta mush. In the meantime, while while you're doing that, does anybody have any questions so far? While while Chris, uh... yeah, that yeah. So let me see. Uh, so someone put Johnny Boy put a photo of a dragon. <laughs> uh, so I guess that means a dragon. Uh, that smooth target brush is mine is blowing my mind. This is from David Quack. Um, so I know David Quack is doing a bunch of blend shapes right now, and he's going through the exact same process as you are. David Quack is one of our one of our best students that we've had at Noman ever. So, oh, nice. Yeah, he's a really talented guy. So he's saying the smooth tar uh, brush target is blowing my mind. Thanks for the tip. This project looks amazing, by the way, guys. Glad I could catch you guys live. So thank you, David. Um, 
Let me see. Uh, Devin Rush, another one of the really good Nomen students, one of the best ones. Matt Painting, Matt Painting, uh, badass. Uh, thank you. So he's trying, David, De Devin is trying to um, figure out how to do projections in Unreal. So that's cool. Um, let me see what else. Oh, yeah, that looks good. So we have Earl. Hey, um, I'm a new artist trying to learn any, any, any and everything I can. How is everyone? Every, we're good. Chris, how are you doing? <laughs> I am good. It's good. All right. So I got this working. So. All right, cool. So now, like, you know, say you're working on Red Skull. I know because I had to do this. <laughs> like on Red Skull. Super handy. Um, so now we can just paint influence areas. So like, say we want the skin to slide over, over like a specific area and we don't want to lose volume, you know, now the shrink wrap is projecting that onto Ooh, that's pretty awesome. the lower surface. <laughs> and, you know, basically it runs for the whole puppet. So any shape that, that is going to deform wherever you painted that it's going to slide over that surface the whole time. Um, so this is one way to like easily affect the entire puppet at once. Um, and, you know, say, you know, you have like a bunch of shapes that you want to slide over something. This is how I would probably start that process. You could literally um, have like a low res kind of skeletal shape underneath and it would, you would pick up all the bones, all the sinewy stuff. Yep. Attendance, That's, everything. Yeah. So, Easy like, if you want to, yeah, if you want to change your underlying structure for this, yeah, that's the type of cool shit that you're gonna get from this. Excuse my, my profanity there. But yeah, like that's that's when you start getting into like more complex types of workflows for collisions. Like it works great for the brows, um, you know. And then, you know, you don't necessarily even need to worry too much about what you're getting here. Like, if the shrink wrap is ruining part of your shape, that's fine, right? Just duplicate out all the in-betweens. And then, you know, if you're using something like Simplex, it will allow you to bring a shape back in over top of that and ripple it back through your in-betweens. So basically, you could then come in add the old shape or, or smooth target the old shape back in to get the forms that may have gotten lost from the shrink wrap. And then it will ripple those changes all the way through. So you're going to get the, the sliding nonlinear motion of that as well as your sculpted shape. Um, so this is super, super handy. Um, you know, like when I was working on Red Skull, I actually modeled, you know, all the underlying mus muscles underneath here. So when the jaw dropped, you could see it slide underneath everything. Um, so super easy, but super handy kind of little tool to use. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think that's kind of all I got. Like, I, I, I don't know. Um, that's good. I could show some of the mocap X stuff now. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be, that'd be perfect. Yeah. That's impressive. That's very yeah, cool man. stuff, Chris. That's um, awesome. And you I don't. You know, even if it seems technical or whatever, you don't get this kind of information. Um, it, it's hard peaceful. because, you know, you're not really going to run into this type of stuff unless, like, your job is to do that, right? And then you're going to be like, how do I do this? And, yeah, the best like, way you hopefully it, you're working with a bunch of smart arts. people. Yeah, yeah, it's dark arts. The dark arts, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Chris just pulled, uh, he just did the Snape lesson. So, yeah, it's awesome. Um. And yeah, if anybody has any questions about anything, just yeah, shout them out. Let me know. Anybody have any questions for Chris uh, before I jump into the mocap X stuff? Oh, are you going to show them the uh, the in between stuff? Do you got any of that hooked up in the mocap? I don't X have stuff? it. I don't have it connected. Uh, we'll we'll pro I'll probably talk about that next week. But right now, I'll just show like um, just a basic. Uh, we only have like fifteen minutes anyway, so I'll just show like the basic setup. Um, so okay so i'm gonna steal your screen yeah please all right well thank you chris that was awesome um cool so uh so let's come over here for a second so here we have koa with some of the shapes uh all the shapes applied but not the in-betweens yet 
So you can see uh, this is all being recorded on my iPhone. And we're using this tool here called Mocap X. Okay. So Mocap X has been uh, kind enough to let us have the software for this project. So I want to thank them for that. Um, it's a pretty simple interface. If you look here on the right hand side, you can see you, you, there's actually a third button, but for the most part, it's like settings record. And there's another button where you can preview the face as either their uh, icon, which is this, this character, or as just a default um, guy here, this guy here will actually be playing over your face. Okay. So we come back over here, you could just go to record and Ideally, you want to you don't want to hold it with your hand. I have heard, I've realized because it doesn't really know if that's your hand moving or your head rotations. We're not going to use head rotations from this on our project because we rather get that from the mocap system. But the face stuff is very cool. OK, so um, let me just come over here real quick. So the way it works. We, you can see we have all our 52 shapes. Oh, let me pull this over here. And let me just open up a file before we did this. Let's just give me one second. So this is a couple versions uh, behind, but uh, it should be fine. And let me just make sure that my plugin is loaded up. So I'm just going to look for my mocap X. And yes, you could see there it is. So it's good to go. So it's pretty straightforward. I'm not going to show the iPhone part of it because there's not much to it. I just basically come over here. Well, let me just show what I can. Uh, well, it's not really going to show because I have to show my face on it. So. Uh, I'll just pull up this thing up here. Where is it? It's basically just like this. So I'm going to press record, and it's going to record my face. And at the end of that, that part I'll show. Um, so let me just record something real fast. So I'll just say something, stop it. And you could see that we get, I don't know if you could see it here. But, it's just white. Yeah, it's just white. But you just basically have clip one, clip two, clip three, and then a share button. Okay, when you press the share button, you could just send it by email. You could send it by AirDrop if you're sending it to another Mac. But I'm just going to email it. Now, it's going to send two things, a video file, and then it's going to send like a text document. But it's not actually a .txt file. It's something else. And if I bring this in here... So I'm going to come over here to my mocap X settings and it's a sim this could be as simple as you want it to be or as complicated. Since we already have our 52 shapes, we don't have to go in and create all our individual shapes because there's a tool here that allows you to use an existing face rig and basically bring the brow up, bring this down, bring this up and basically create uh, the shapes that it's asking for here. So you can see here it's saying, Give me brow down L, which means left. So if you didn't have the 52 shapes already, but you had a face rig, you could bring down the clusters, bring this joints down, rotate it, whatever. And once you have that shape looking like this, you just press the plus button and it would load that up as a blend shape inside of, a, a, inside of your outliner. And you would just go down through all of these and basically create your 52 shapes here. So again, this is if you didn't have Awesome Chris or if you didn't model them yourself and now you're making them based off an existing face rig, okay? So you don't have shapes, It's maybe it's joint base or whatever. So there you go. We don't have this issue, so we're gonna skip this part. And I'm just gonna come over here to the setting that says Create Mocap X Clip Reader, okay? And when it does that, I'm gonna have this guy over here. And you can see it says pick mocap X clip. Okay. If I come over here, this is pretty simple. I'm just going to go to my desktop. I have a folder called delete. Um, let's just come over here to number two. 
and you can see there it is, .mcpx, okay? And this is the text file. It's gonna take a second, so it's frozen, and then you can see all of a sudden, you see the list of all your 52 shapes appear below. If I move the time uh, line here, if I press play, you're gonna see the values start going up and down, up and down, whatever, okay? So you could see that it's looking at this text file and from this text file, it now knows how much to trigger every single one of those shapes, okay? So that's pretty cool. If you use the Unreal uh, Face AR version, which is free, but it has to go into Unreal, it kind of gives you these values as well. So you, even in the viewport, you could see, oh, it's triggering this, this much or whatever, okay? So, okay, that's cool, but you can see that she's not moving at all. None of her shapes are moving. So now if I go to the, my connection editor, I'll have this, okay? And I'm just gonna come over here to my shapes here. So this is my blend shapes. Let me just make sure I have this. Did I kill off all the shapes? I might have killed off all the shapes. So let me just uh, open up this file one more time. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. So let me just bring this. Uh, just give me one second. And it should be, I'll bring this one in here. This might already be slightly connected, but if it is, I'll just show you. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. So this should have the shapes already connected, but I'm gonna show you. Uh, so we could see here in our mocap X, we have our clip reader. Uh, so connection editor, okay. So you can see the connection editor um, has every single shape that mocap X is looking for. And if I come over here and I open up my blend shape editor, let me just make sure I um, get rid of, uh, I have some animation layers, so just give me one second. Okay. So, one second. Sorry about that. So yeah, I just have a bunch of nodes here already. A bunch of keys, I mean. Let me just let me just strip them out. Okay, perfect. Okay. So I'm gonna select my all my blend shapes. I've just come over here, select blend shape uh, node, and then I'm just gonna reload it to the right. And then you could see we have our, our list of blend shapes here. So this is literally reading our blend shape uh, shapes, our shape editor. So all you have to do is here on the left are the shapes from um, mocap X, the ones it's looking for. And then you go, okay, brow down left, brow down left, brow down right, brow down right, brow interrupt. Uh, brow interrupt left and right. So you could see these are combined. So we'll do that. Brow outer up left, brow outer up left, brow outer up right. And we just go through this. One thing I highly recommend is you do this with your attributes being set to alphabetical. The first time I did this, I, you know, I don't do a lot of connection editor stuff and I didn't do that. And it was like finding uh, like, where's Waldo? It was kind of annoying. Every shape it was somewhere else. So you just go in here and you just start plugging these. And it seems like a pain in the ass. And it is. It's not fun, but it's not. Uh... So this is look out left. So let me make sure I put this correctly. Look out right. Look out right. I might have uh, put these incorrectly. Look in left. Look up uh, left, look up right. And like I was saying earlier, when you're dealing with, oh, so these are, this one's wrong. 
So I squint left. I wide left. Okay. So you just go through this uh, forward uh, jaw left. So jaw left, jaw open, jaw open, jaw right, jaw right. Jaw. There's no jaw back, uh, which is weird. Um, uh, that's my bad. I uh, threw that in there. Okay. I mean, it's a good shape. When I when I was seeing it, I was like, I wish we had that. So mouth dimple, mouth dimple right. So you can see it moves fairly quickly. There's a high probability that because I'm doing this so quick and I have a camera on my face that I might have picked the wrong thing at some point. But uh, when you do this, you'll do this much more carefully. Mouth pucker. Hey, Miguel, I got a question for you. Yeah. Um, if the shape isn't named properly, doesn't matter. You can, you can still connect it in, right? Totally. That's pretty cool. Which is which is a good thing. And this is when when we started doing this this week. I think you and I had like a eureka moment, like at the same time, where I messaged you and I'm like, "Hey, dude, considering how simple this is, couldn't you technically do this and this?" And you were like, "I was thinking the exact same thing right now." We were like uh, doing some. Uh, <sighs> X-Men shit there. So <laughs> collaboration. Yeah. Little, so little we just connect teamwork. all this. Uh so no sneer, no sneer, no sneer right, no sneer right. Okay. So once you have that, I'm pretty sure I screwed up one of the eye blinks here. So let's go. Oh, I, I didn't put these two. So let's look at eye blink. So eye blink left, eye blink. Right. And yeah, that is where I screwed it up. So that's not that. And that's not that. So I look down. It's connected to that. Those are the ones that I knew I had wrong. Okay. So now everything is connected. And now you can see as soon as I press play, boom, she's alive, which is pretty awesome. Like this thing is like amazing for what it yeah. is. Like these are the old teeth, right? Yeah. This is an, an older, uh, version so the teeth have changed but this is the one that i had that was uh disconnected but so let me just jump uh so let me just jump well actually let me just stay here for a minute so yeah it's pretty freaking amazing uh chris did you want to add anything sorry i cut you off no 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 i i you know i just think that this like the results are far better than i expected um yeah. So here's some of the issues. You could see this here where if you come over here, you can see when all the shapes are triggered at the same time, if you zoom in here, you can see that some stuff is being overcranked and it's uh, interpenetrating. If you're just using the straight up AR kit and you're plugging this directly into Unreal, I don't think there's a lot of stuff you could do because it, it wants those 52 shapes in Unreal and that's it. However, if you're doing it this way, all you're really using from MoCap X, which is a, actually a good thing, is you're having it read this data and do the connection for you. There's no reason why you couldn't have what's called combo shapes, combination shapes, where we now create another shape that says, hey, when the blink, so if we look at this, we could see how everything is being triggered. So when I blink left and right, go to 0.87, plus cheek squint left and right, go up to 56, and brow down is at 0.4. Now, a lot of that stuff is overlapping information, and then you end up getting this overcranked information. You could now go in, select those three shapes, four shapes, whatever, and create a combination shape that will ride on top of that. And it's basically like a, it's almost like a set driven key, right? For the most part, it's like- It's very similar. Are on together. Yeah, if these three are on at the same time, put this guy on top and it's kind of doing like a math inversion in the way that fixes this for the most part. That's a simple way of, of saying it. It cleans this up and it avoids this, uh, which is something that is pretty incredibly powerful. So you could start getting a ridiculously complex face rig that is way beyond the 52 shapes by just using this program. 
The other thing that you could do is you could do uh, in between shapes for like the eye blinks. So uh, that's something, again, it doesn't care if one of the sliders is just one shape or if there's 50 in between shapes, it'll still do the 50 in between shapes because all it ultimately cares about is that uh, data that is being read is triggering this one shape. If that shape has four in between shapes, it doesn't care. If those three shapes are triggering a combo shape, it doesn't care. And since we're ultimately going to export all of this out as an Alembic file, it shouldn't be a problem at all, which is pretty incredible. Uh, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll uh, pass this on to any other questions. Uh, the look was, it's still, it's pretty cool, but we still wanted it to be uh, a little bit more cartoony. So what we could do here is just select our blend shape node, bake all this out. So just give it a second. It's going through the timeline. Okay. And then I could just go to my graph editor. Here we go. Select my keys. Curves, I'll resample them to be every two frames. So it's deleting information. So one of the things we wanna do is kinda bring down the quality so that we're not fighting the technology. We want it to feel a little bit more handmade. So we are now deleting every other key and we're setting the step tangents. And now when we press play, you can see we get a little bit more of a stop motion feel to this, which works pretty damn well. And what I've noticed is some of the, the noise that we get from the AR kit kind of works to its advantage once you get the step, step tangents feel. Uh, I went in and, in a few tests this week and I started trying to reduce the noise using like the Butterworth filter or whatever. Um, and it actually didn't look as good. It looked better with the noise once it was uh, set to be this kind of step feel. And then let's just open up uh, the final one here. It has the correct teeth. So you can see the teeth here are a little bit long. Uh, we showed this to uh, two friends of ours that are also face modelers. They recommended. Uh, we do a little makeover on the teeth. Yeah. Well, now the hard part is like you put the teeth in. You don't really know what it, it's doing until the face starts moving. So, until the face starts moving. Yeah. yeah. So you can see the, the teeth here are a little bit rounder, a little bit the uh, gums have been brought down a little bit. And, uh, and yeah. then this one has the fixed eye textures and everything. Yeah. So you could see on the blinks, um, well, you, there's no you could weird see it. stretching. You could see it when it anytime it was like half close. So yeah. like when you look at Chris's file, the eyelid looks really weird. Yeah, it's just <laughs> so. broken. Mm -hmm. Although I will say, hey, uh, Miguel, can you go back to where the 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 beginning where her mouth is opening? I want to yeah. say I think I see some teeth drifting in there. Like the, the teeth bottom are, teeth. Yeah, like they're not following. Uh, you see there? Right there. You see how they're moving like yeah. independently? Yeah, kind yeah. of bouncing. I know yeah. why that's happening. Uh, it's being that's being connected at the moment. Um, it's the teeth are basically working as a blend shape. They're not connected to the mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. jaw joint yet. I so see. I did this just to kind of do a quick setup for today. But yeah, they they will be parented to the actual jaw joint. That way, they don't get that because you're basically getting like in betweens. Yeah, yeah. and the tongue is like not moving at all. Yeah, it's just hanging out there. <laughs> so. Yeah. So that'll that'll be fixed uh, in the final one. But yeah. Um, that's our COA and uh, uh, MoCapX. Cannot recommend this tool enough. It's super simple. Uh, the fact that you can do this on your iPhone is pretty incredible. You can do like a live stream also. So you could like I could have uh, that like I could be talking and Koa would be talking right now. I haven't really looked into that because I know that that's not something we're going to ever do. But um, it's still pretty cool that it's there. And the fact that all of this is being driven off of an iPhone, it's just bananas, you know, it's insane. So, yeah. Does anybody have any questions on 
this for us or for uh, Chris? <laughs> so we Chicken? have is, is that crickets? Yes, it's crickets. crickets. <laughs> <laughs> we do actually have crickets sometimes. Yeah, we actually there is uh, crickets that sometimes come into the house, literally, which is not a big deal. <laughs> but when we were shooting the Nino here, uh, and that freaking cricket was ruining our sound, it was like World War Three. It was like we're gonna find that fucking cricket and kill him. <laughs> so. Uh, this stream is like the TED Talk of CG Talk. Thank you, Chris, for the demo. That's that's very nice. And that's from yes. Michael, another uh, great student. Uh, oh, thank you. He does a lot of really beautiful faces. Uh, Elvira, also another one of our superstar. Uh, yeah, definitely superstar. From, um, from Noman that went to go work at, uh, where are you now, Elvira? You left uh, Activision. Uh, did you know the closer you get to something, the tougher it is to see it? Yes, for all the time. I know that. Uh, just some people saying thank you, JD Smith. Uh, we had uh, Jared jumping in a little bit earlier. He's an amazing concept artist and also has a great uh, stream on the Nomen channel. So yes, check that it's out. super Creature awesome. Corner with my good friend Matt. Um, so a virus with eyes out. So, so yeah, if that's it, guys. Well, thank you so much. Um, I hope you guys get something out of this. Uh, I think it's a real treat to have to have Chris to have Chris show up. You don't. Oh well, have, thank you. Thank you for showing up, and thank you for doing. I this. agree with you guys. I am a treat to have. He yes, he is. That's why um, he calls himself sometimes Krispy Kreme, <laughs> which I think is the, the greatest thing ever. It's, it's huge for us because you can have a still model that looks all right, but it comes down to performances. So, you know, if you don't have this, it's, it's going to suck. I think. Well, you and know, you I think at the, the end of the day, um, some people kind of forget that, like, you're never really looking at the base model. Like when it's in a shot, oh, it's, it's moving. Like you'll never see it in that context of a look dev turntable or how that's looking. So as soon as you get it into a shot, it could feel completely different or it might not work the way you wanted or it works better than what you expected. Um, yeah, so that's what's happening here. <laughs> it's one of, working one of the greatest than feelings I think but, for, for CG artists is the first time they ever see their character animated. I remember at Luma when I first saw uh, some of the werewolves from Underworld movies moving. I was just, it was like seeing, it was the closest a man will ever experience to giving direct birth to a, to a baby. So, you know, you're like, oh my God, it's alive. But, but, yeah, and I think Chris makes a, a really good point because you don't see it in the neutral pose. So if you've ever watched a movie where there is a, a realistic human being made you, and then it doesn't come all the way through. Well, one, a realistic human is super, super hard. Um, but that's, and the still, it probably looked really great, right? And then when it started performing, it wasn't all the way there, yeah. so. One thing, I'll, the last thing I wanna show is just one of the cool things about this mocap X thing, by the way, uh, is just how quick it is to say, okay, that's cool, but let me do another blend shape here, another, uh, selection so i could just come over here just come back over here switch the file out and now she's performing completely different yeah that's pretty cool so it's not like you have to reset this whole thing up um for every single shot which is pretty incredible so but yeah anyway guys thank you so much chris dude you're the best we love you for real uh we couldn't have made the Nino without you, and we can't make this without you. So, oh, yeah, we couldn't. I was like, "What are we gonna do?" Well, anyway, Chris, you guys can on. hire me on full time. I accept dog food, and um, <laughs> as long as you guys have pet insurance, I'm in. Oh, well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Chris has been having some pet uh, problems. Poor guy. Let me tell you, those vets, mm, yeah. they got a license to print money. <laughs> like, if you guys want to see more on Chris and 
most of his images are of his dog, but if you keep scrolling down, there's some incredible artwork. And then you could also see his beautiful dog. Click on that. Ginger Stud 69 <laughs> cannot be a more appropriate name. So check him out. And thanks, everybody. Um, see you guys next week. And we are out of here. Is this the right one? This is the right one. All right, guys. Later.